Well, let's dive a little further into the fast fashion industry. Christiane Campbell, mm -hmm. partner at the Dwayne Morris Law Firm, joins us now from Philadelphia. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks. Now, it, it's actually quite impressive just how quickly these companies are able to really crank these styles out. So logistically, how are the, the Zaras, the Fashion Novas and these e-commerce stores able to copy and mass produce designs so quickly? Well, a lot of it has to do with their supply chain. Um, but, you know, as far as them becoming aware of the designs that are going to be popular with consumers and marketable co to consumers, it's very easy for them to be online, following social media, media generally, seeing what, um, you know, celebrities such as Kim Kardashian are wearing and posting on their social media accounts for them to copy. I mean, the, the sweat equity doesn't have to go into them just merely looking at design and then drawing it, sending it overseas or wherever they do through their supply chain and mass producing very quickly on a large scale to, to make money through their own retail outlets. So you mentioned sort of looking at these social media accounts, but what are other kinds of legal loopholes have allowed some of these fashion copycats to thrive? So it's, um, it, it's not necessarily legal loopholes as much as it is gaps in the protection that's afforded to, um, to different fashion designs. Usually when we're thinking about the legal protections afforded to fashion designs, we're talking about patents, uh, trademarks, including trade dress, and copyright. And when it comes to the actual designs um, on clothing articles, accessories, and shoes, we're usually talking about copyright. And very specifically, copyright law in the United States does not protect functional objects and does not protect ideas. So when you think about the way that the U.S. courts and law look at clothing designs, accessories, um, clothing, apparel, and shoes, they treat them as functional objects. Now, the courts have said there's a separation between the design aspects and the functional aspects of a, design, of a you know, fashion design. Um, the problem for a lot of the designers is that much of their fashion designs are considered to be functional. So there's a very limited amount of a design that is considered design only and protectable. And it can be something of a minefield, because even if it's not an entire item, it could be a signature design element, like the red bottom soles on, on Louboutins, or as we saw with the logo, mm -hmm. with the three slanted stripes on Adidas. Now, Louboutin won its lawsuit in Europe, but the court ruled against Adidas, saying it wasn't a unique enough design. How do companies navigate this issue from one country to another? It is a challenge, because the United States, I would say, is probably one of the countries where it's more challenging. Uh, to protect fashion designs through intellectual property laws. Um, the, the designs you're mentioning can be both the subjects of trademark protection or trade dress protection and also copyright protection. Uh, the challenge with protecti protecting trade dress in the United States is that there's a requirement that in order to assert and successfully allege a trade dress violation, the, the design element has to have been out there in use um, and have really been in the market long enough such that it's got what's called secondary meaning, or that it's acquired distinctiveness. Um, so elements like the Labotin Red Sole, the Adidas uh, Three Stripes, things like that are eligible for protection of trade dress um, and, and are more easily enforceable. It is a challenge, though, globally, because you know there are countries um, like the United States that don't afford as many protections, or countries like France or Italy that are a little bit more design friendly. Now let's talk profitability, because when you compare the revenue that these companies make, either from selling the copied version or presenting false affiliations with celebrities, with the amount that they actually have to pay in these lawsuits and damages, do these copycat companies still come out ahead financially? In a way, they do. Um, a lot of these copycat companies, or even just fast design ha fashion houses, whether you call them um, copycats or not, have actually a reserve for um, a monetary reserve through which they, they pay settlements for a lot of these lawsuits. For them, it's a lot easier to merely pay to settle and get on with their business. Um, the way fashion moves in the United States and elsewhere throughout the world, it's very fast. So if they settle a lawsuit, they've already made sales, and they agree to discontinue um, the sale of a particular design, it's really not that much harm to them if they've already put the money aside to settle. Uh, a lawsuit could be very long and drawn out with damages at the end. Um, and, and could far exceed the amount of time and money it took to, to get a design out the door and then roll into the next season or whatever it may be. 
And just quickly, we have about 20 seconds. If you're a large company or a celebrity, you have a lot more means and power to fight back than if you're one of these perhaps small businesses who are being infringed upon. What sort of recourse, if you're just a small business, do you have? It's challenging um, because it, just getting the protections at the beginning, is not, it's not cheap. It's not easy. Um, but getting your designs out there, again, it, there's a lot of sweat equity that goes into it. There's a lot of creativity and, and art. You know, a lot of designers would argue that what they design to be worn on the red carpet or at the Met Gala is art and very much um, protectable as such. So copyright protection um, can really be your friend if you're a small designer there. Um, but it, it's definitely a challenge to be out there enforcing your rights against the big guys. Christiane Campbell, their partner at Dwayne Morris.